or sorry, when they grew by 30,000 people in the 2000s. The other big story there is Anchorage. Uh, Anchorage was just about where they were in 2010 and 2020. They were down by 600 people. This doesn't sound like a small, it's not a big loss at all, but the real story is that Anchorage didn't grow. Um, they've grown for decades, so it's a story in itself that Anchorage didn't grow across this decade. And part of that is the migration to Matsu. As we all know, people migrate from Anchorage to Matsu. And to quantify that a little bit, we track uh, migration by PFD records. And between 2010 and 2020, 10,000 people, 10,000 more people moved from Anchorage to Matsu than Matsu to Anchorage. So Anchorage saw a 10,000 person net migration loss just to Matsu alone. Kenai also benefits from um, Anchorage migration and they grew by 3,400. So South Central grew, but Anchorage itself did not, did not really grow. Some other areas of the state that grew pretty quickly were the Northern and Western region. Uh, Northern region grew by 9%, the Western region grew by 5%. And this kind of goes against the national trend that we were seeing where rural areas down South really didn't grow this de past decade, but the urban areas did. Our rural areas as a whole grew faster than our urban areas. So a little bit different than uh, the lower 48. The Aleutians, we saw declines out there overall, but this is largely related to group quarters population. So like, you know, fish processors were down, not as many people there. That has a big impact on their census counts. Southeast, uh, Juneau was up by nearly a thousand. Around the rest of Southeast, kind of small losses and small gains. Uh, Skagway, as far as growth rate goes, was our fastest grower, but only grew by 272 people, just a small population. So, you know, rates look bigger. Uh, Fairbanks was the, had the biggest loss in population, losing 1,900 people. And there's a little bit going on there. Uh, we think there was an undercount at the UAF dormitories. That was down by 800 people, 2010 to 2020. And we don't think that's a real drop. We think that's more due to COVID that the kids went home at spring break and then just didn't come back. And so the census kind of had a nightmare situation there where they were trying to count people who weren't there. Um, it was a tough situation all around the country, but we think there was an undercount there. Another thing to note about Fairbanks, the F-35 squadron that is now at Ileson was not there for the 2020 census. So they were not counted in the borough, but they will be in our population estimates. So Fairbanks should see some pretty decent growth here this next year. And then to round it out, the interior as a whole also declined in population. Um, pretty small losses, but still declined uh, all in the interior. So the other big story that came out of the census was the racial makeup of the country shifted quite a bit. And this is a little bit tough to compare 2010 to 2020. It's not really like an apples to apples comparison. The 2020 census changed the race question quite a bit. And um, Sorry, I saw there's a question in the chat here. Do you think the census numbers are a true reflection in light of COVID? Um, so the census numbers, there was definitely some difficulty. The census feels good about the, the, the results. Um, they have follow-up procedures that they came in and tried to track people down who didn't respond. So we think the count was pretty good as a whole, but there is currently occurring right now a post-enumeration survey. And when we get the results from that, we'll have a better idea of what the census actually looked like. We've seen some kind of some oddities in our data, but contacting different boroughs, it seems like some things might've been off in 2010 and maybe 2020 was a little low, but they didn't really see too much wrong with it. So um, we're still kind of working on, on going through the data and trying to find any oddities that we, that we can. But as far as the race data goes, they, they changed the question quite a bit in 2020. So for the white population and the African-American population, they offered a write-in box. And this is something that people definitely took advantage of. And this led to big declines in the race alone population. The white race alone population actually declined by 8%, but the white alone or in combination was only down about half a percent. So pretty flat over the decade. Similarly, African-Americans, were down by 6% for African-American alone, but alone or in combination, they were up by 7%. So it's just that people were writing in more, um, writing in options in the text boxes that were available to them. And you can see this in the growth in the two or more population, which grew by over 70%. 
Uh, our Alaska Native population grew very similarly to the last decade. The Alaska Native owner and combination was up by 22,000 people, and they did increase as a share of the total population going from 19% to 22%. We also saw steady growth in our Asian and Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander populations. And the Hispanic population grew a little slower than the last decade, but still a lot of growth there for Hispanics. The real story though, is this some other race category. Uh, that's this really tall orange bar that kind of dwarfs everyone is the some other race alone or in combination growth. It grew, grew by over 160%. And we, we're still trying to figure out exactly what this is. Down South, a lot of the some other race category is the Hispanic population. But in Alaska, this growth is largely our non-Hispanic white combined with some other race. So, so the two together, so the person selected white and then wrote in something in the box that got classified as some other race. We don't know what they classified in the some other race category. And we're hoping to get some information on that going forward so we can kind of untangle what's going on there because it's a lot of growth and it really jumped out at us. It wasn't something we were expecting, but we're hoping to get some more information on that going forward. All right, so now we'll get into how the population has changed and how kind of think the future will look. Um, these next slides are not based on the 2020 census. We will be coming out with an estimate series that uses the 2020 census, but that will not come out until our January uh, estimate series comes out um, later or early next year. So here we have Alaska's total population from 1946 through 2020. And during this time, we've just seen pretty much steady growth, uh, going from about 100,000 in 1946 up to about 730,000 in 2020. And during this time, growth has been the default. And that's why these losses since 2016 really jump out. Uh, prior to those losses, we had only lost population on three other occasions. And those were pretty unique situations where we lost population. You know, you could really point to a single event and say, that's why we lost population. So in the seventies, the pipeline was completed. Uh, we lost population there. And this was almost an expected population loss because you have this transient workforce who came up here to work on the pipeline. Once that job was done, they headed off to other jobs or went back home. They were here for one purpose. And then when that was done, um, they took off and left the state, which was not a, you know, a huge surprise. The next time we lost population was definitely a surprise. We had been building our population in the 80s. We were flush with oil money. And then the bottom fell out on oil prices. And these people who had just moved up here, you know, didn't have as many roots in the state. They kind of left the state in mass. And then, and then again, here with the with the population losses since 2016, there's not really a single event that we can point to to say, that's why we lost population this time. Um, but it's definitely a unique situation. The losses are very small, but definitely notable just because we've not seen population losses in the past. So every time we've lost population, it has been related to net migration. And this is because Alaska sees a lot of growth due to what we call natural increase. And what this is, is just when births outnumber deaths. And so Alaska easily has more births than deaths. And so we see steady growth from that. And we've had net migration losses in the past, but in general, our, our natural increase is able to make up for that. And we still see the population growing. It is notable that this is the first time that we've lost population to net or had net migration losses eight years in a row. This is the longest streak that we've lost population due to net migration. And at this point, we've now lost more than we did in the 80s, losing 43,000 people to, my, to net migration across the decade. So natural increase is something that we take for granted in Alaska. We like I said, we easily have more births and deaths, but this isn't necessarily the case in the lower 48. So this is a map that was actually in the Wall Street Journal the other a uh, few days ago, and it shows states that had more deaths than births. And so they experienced what we call a natural decrease. And in 2019, there were five states with natural decrease. And then in 2020, there were 25 states. And yes, there is somewhat COVID here increasing deaths and that pushed it beyond births. 
But what's really happening is there's a demographic shift that's slowly been occurring. We have this massive baby boomer generation that has been aging up and have now started to reach these higher mortality age groups. And as they continue aging, we will see deaths increase quite a bit. That combined with lower birth rates, we're gonna start to see natural decrease occur more often. It might not become the norm, but it's definitely gonna occur in certain places um, uh, across the country. Now in Alaska, we're nowhere near natural decrease and we might not ever actually reach it just simply due to the fact that we lose people at these at the retirement ages. So, you know, we might see enough people migrate out that we don't ever actually see natural decrease, but our birth rates have declined in recent years. Um, in 2019 and 2020, we saw our number of births drop below 10,000. This was the first time this has happened since the early 2000s when births went below 10,000. And what happened here is we have the children of the baby boomers or millennials kind of starting to hit higher fertility ages. And so we saw our births increase going up through 2010, 2011. And then as the millennials started to age beyond their highest uh, birth ages and the fact they didn't have as many kids as their parents, we started to see declines in births um, later in the decade. And this decline in births will continue just based on the age structure in Alaska. So here we have a population pyramid. And the way these work is we have the ages on the on this on the left side, our males are on the left, females are on the right, and then our counts of population along the bottom. And so here we can kind of see three large cohorts. We have the baby boomer population that's in mid 50s to mid 70s. We have their kids or the millennials that are 40s down to mid 20s. And then the children of the millennials down here about 15 on down. And so the high birth age groups are typically in the 20s and the lower 30s. And so in the 2010s, we had this big group of millennials go through those ages. And so that is what caused this uptick in births. But now this cohort that is about to enter these ages is quite a bit smaller than the millennial group. And so we will see declines in numeric births, no matter what happens to birth rates in the coming future. There could be some years where we see slight upticks, but overall there will be a pattern of declining births in the future, um, at least until this group starts to hit higher fertility ages. But they're quite a bit smaller than their parents because they just did not have as high birth rates as their parents. And you can see this down here at the bottom. So this is about four-year-olds here. And so we've had declining births since 2016. And so you can start to see these smaller cohorts um, behind them. And so as those groups start to re reach school age, we will see this start to decline going forward. And, and that's just kind of a continuation of the pattern that we saw due to declining birth rates in the state. So the year 2000 was kind of a high point for the school age population. We had this massive group of people who came into the state in the 80s and 90s. They had kids, their kids were largely still in school in the year 2000. And then as they started to graduate, we saw this decline. And then by the year 10,000, or sorry, by the year 2010, we were down to around 133,000 school aged kids. Again, we see some increase then as the millennials kids start to hit school age, but we are gonna to start to see declines in this going forward at least for the next few years. It's tough to say what's gonna happen with births due to COVID. Um, we think that there will be a delay or we think there'll be a drop in births in the immediate future. There might be some increase in like 2022, 2023 due to delayed pregnancies, but that's yet to be seen. We don't have births data from the first half of 2021. Uh, normally we would by now, but the DHSS hack has unfortunately kind of delayed data production over there. So. We're anxiously awaiting births data for the first uh, half of this year. So on the opposite end of the age spectrum is a group that will continue to grow and that's our senior population. So here we see the, senior, the 65 plus population from the year 2000 and then projected out to the year 2030. So these projections are based on our 2019 population projections. And with these population projections, we do different scenarios. So births and deaths, we have a pretty good handle on. So we hold that constant for all three scenarios, but then we, we change up the net migration rate for each scenario. So the high scenario assumes a 1% net migration rate. The low scenario assumes a negative 1% net 
net migration rate. And the middle scenario is based on the last about 30 years of data. And what this leaves us with is a negative 0.1% net migration rate in these projections. So just slightly negative. The low scenario reflects the net migration rate we've seen in recent years that has caused population losses. So we kind of know what that will, would lead to if it continues. But this is a group that's not heavily impacted by migration. People just don't tend to move that much after 65 um, when compared to at the working ages. So this group has really grown a lot in the past, uh, you know, about 38,000 in 2000 up to, um, so up to 55,000 in 2010 and then reaching 95,000 in 2020. And this group will continue to grow. Right now in Alaska, we estimate there are about 95,000 people between the ages of 55 and 64. And while some of these people will migrate out of the state, a lot of them will stay in the state and age into this age group. So we expect to see continued growth in the 65 plus population. The baseline scenario has us reaching uh, 134,000 people in 2030 for the 65 plus population. But the real story this next decade is gonna be the growth in the 75 plus population. And this is a group that we just haven't had that many people in this age group. Right now in 2020, there are 31,000 people in Alaska age 75 or above. So not, not very many people. And this is a group that's gonna need a different level of care than that population age 65 to 74. Um, 75 plus just needs a lot more services that we might not have in place. And so we've seen a lot of growth in our medical industry in the state over the last decade, and that will likely have to continue into this next decade um, going forward. Our projections don't vary too much between the high, medium, and low. The high is about 2,000 above the baseline. The low is about 1,000 below. Um, but overall, we think this group will reach about 59,000 people by 2030. So nearly, nearly doubling over the next decade. So a group that really is impacted by net migration is the working age population. And you can see how much they're impacted just by the gaps between the different scenarios. And again, births and deaths are held constant, or the, the rates are held the same. It's just the net migration that varies. So that's the only thing that makes it vary. And we get these very broad um, gaps between the different scenarios. Now, this is a group that has declined across the decade. And Ultimately, at the beginning of the decade, it was not due to net migration. It was simply due to the baby boomers aging out of this uh, age group. So once ha about half the baby boomers aged out of it, they continued aging out, we started to see population losses. So in 2013, this group topped out at 479,000 people and then started to slowly decline. But then in 2016, when the state started to decline, uh, we really started to see population losses in this group. And so from 2016 to 2020, we lost 20,000 working age people with the population going from 472,000 to 451,000. So a pretty big drop over four years. And there's some explanation for this. I mean, you know, obviously it's related to net migration, but we saw a lot of people move into the state in when the Great Recession was occurring in the lower 48, our economy wasn't hit as hard. So we had a lot of working age people move into the state and then you know, it's possible that once things got better down south, they just immediately up and left. So that could, you know, lead to some of these big net, net migration losses that we're seeing. But I've got a few slides that will talk about net migration more in, uh, in just a minute. So for this for this um, age group, the baseline projection has it growing slightly to, in 2030 up to 454,000. So only about a 3,000 person increase. And this is largely related to the fact that the baby boomers are still continuing to age out of this group. So just not seeing much growth because of that um, aging out, but then reaching 478,000 in 2040. The low scenario has us declining to 406,000 in 2030 and then 382,000 in 2040. And the high scenario has us reaching 626,000 by 2040. So the low scenario, again, is the net migration that we've been seeing these past few years. And if this were to continue, we start to see some weirdness in our labor force. So here we have our labor force participation rate going from 2000 to 2019. As you can see, this has declined pretty sharply. 
uh, going from about 70% in 2000 to 66% in 2010, and then on down to about 61% in 2019. So for the projections, I held the 2019 labor force constant and then just divided that by the 16 plus population to get the labor force participation rate. And as you can see, the labor force participation rate would have to climb pretty steadily in order to maintain this 2019 labor force. And that's just not something that we think can happen uh, just based on the formula itself using 16 plus. It's not realistic to think that like, you know, 80 plus year olds are gonna be jumping into the labor force. Um, so it's unlikely, So, which basically that means our labor force would have to shrink if we continue to see these net migration losses. And so to give you an idea about how net migration has changed over the years, I've got a few slides here that show average annual net migration for five-year intervals. So here we have net mi average annual net migration by age for 2005 to 2010. This is a time period of growth for Alaska. Uh, down south is experiencing the Great Recession. We're doing pretty good. So we're seeing a lot of people moving in um, at these working ages. So around 20 on out to 50. This is a little more growth than we typically see in Alaska at, at these ages. The 40 year olds, we don't necessarily see this much growth on a normal basis. This is normally down around zero. But again, with the Great Recession, we saw a lot of working age people coming up that we might not have had in the past. These people bring their children, so we see growth here. We lose kids as they're graduating high school. You know, they want to get out of the state. They're starting college, military, any number of things. But we pretty consistently see losses at this age group, and then we see losses after 50 uh, declining into these uh, retirement ages. But then up around 75, there's just not much migration occurring. So 2010 to 2015, you kind of start to see a shift occurring here. Uh, still the same pattern. This is, you know, our basic gaining at the working ages, but we're starting to lose people in the 40s. Again, not too surprising given that, you know, we had this big increase that we don't normally see. So these same people might have exited the state at that time. We do see an increase in uh, outmigration here, and that's not necessarily due to outmigration rates going through the roof. It's just the rates are about the same 2010 to 2015 at these ages. But what's happened is, numerically speaking, we have more people at these ages. And so you just see more losses despite the rates staying the same. So this is something that was pretty expected. There was some question on whether baby boomers would leave the state in retirement. But they, um, it's becoming clear that they are going to leave the state at the same rate as the previous generations. And then we have a question in the chat. Are we losing more people to the military than we gain in the right after high school agrees? Uh, or ageism, I guess. Uh, so that's a good question. I think we probably gain military. So we see, we normally see growth in this 20 to 24 age group. So it's just these immediate ages, like right when people are leaving uh, high school. But I would have to do like kind of a head to head. It's, uh, we don't get age data on the military. So it's tough to say if we're really losing at what ages, uh, versus gaining at what ages. We just get overall counts of the military population. So, and then while we are gaining at the working ages here, we see losses at this youngest age group. And this is just kind of an interesting thing to do with fertility rates. So in Alaska, fertility, fertility rates are much higher than much of the lower 48. And so what's happening is we have working age people coming into the state and they're bringing their kids but we have working age people leaving the state and they're bringing more kids than the people coming up are bringing. So we're still gaining here, but just it's just the family sizes are smaller that are coming in versus the family sizes that are going out. And yes, I, I would agree a lot. College is definitely a driver as far as uh, migration out at these ages, or again, just wanting to leave home and go see the world, I guess. <laughs> So then 2015 to 2020, average annual net migration, we really started to see things shift at this point. Um, not much change here at these older ages, because again, we're not seeing these massive flows of out migration. Um, the real difference is in these working age groups is where the gap is. And this is because people aren't coming into the state. It's not so much that we're seeing a massive wave of people leaving the state. 
the out migration has been pretty steady. We've seen some increases in the number of people leaving the state, but again, that's just because the baby boomer generation is fully into these ages where we've always had out migration. So that's going to cause some numeric uh, increase in out migration. But what's really causing the net losses is that we're not having people enter the state um, at these working ages. And again, that causes kind of a you know, trickle down effect in the lower ages, just not as many people coming in, more people going out. So we don't see as much growth here. And to kind of look at that a little more closely. So here we have gross, mig gross migration 2015 to 2020. It, we're, at, we're averaging a little over 40,000 people leaving the state a year here. And then this orange line is in migration. We're having about 35,000 people coming into the state. So the issue is the number of in, -migra in migrants has declined substantially. And we're going to continue to see this gap. We're never going to see, we're not going to become a hub for seniors, I don't think. So we're not going to see a lot of growth here from migration. But these are the ages where we normally see this line would be outside here. And that would allow for population growth from that migration or breaking even, you know, just pretty close. Alaska historically has kind of averaged around zero net migrants across decades. Just, you know, we have big swings, but ultimately they kind of average each other out. But these most recent decade, we have not been averaging it out. And you can kind of see this in the population age structure at this point. Um, here we have 2010 represented by the columns and then 2020 represented by this yellow line. So 20, 24, 25 to 29, these people have largely kind of aged in place and then moved into this 30 to 39 age groups. But there hasn't been anyone to come in behind them. So we know 15 to 19 year olds, we lose these, lose a lot of people here, but we normally have people coming in in their 20s that we're just not seeing there. And some of this is related to just age structure, uh, you know, cohort wise, you have baby boomers, Generation X and millennials. Generation X is much smaller than the baby boomers. So yes, there are less births, but we would generally see some people coming in around these ages. Another thing to notice is this big baby boomer age group here, uh, 45 to 49, 50 to 54. They're now in this 55 to 64 age range. And this group has lost over 10,000 people to migration um, just over the last 10 years. So we've seen, you can kind of see how these people are hitting these retirement ages and then leaving the state, which is again, something we've always seen. We just haven't had many people at these ages. And one last thing I just kind of wanted to point out, this isn't the first time that we've been in this situation. Um, year 2000 in the columns here, 2010 is represented by this yellow line. So 2000, lots of people in their you know, 30s or late 30s, 40s, uh, in prime working ages, not too many people behind them. This group, you know, they age forward, but we saw a lot of migration come in here uh, to, to make up for the, for the losses. Um, we did have a massive historic recession down south, which drove people into the state. So it's kind of tough to say what could shift to occur, have this occur again. But we have been in this situation before, and you know, it's, it's not an unprecedented situation as far as uh, having this gap in the labor force that we're seeing now. All right, that's all I have prepared, but I'd be happy to take any questions or um, any any uh, comments or anything. All right, well, thank you so much, David. Um, all right, we will take audience questions, so you can submit those in the chat, or if you'd like to ask your question directly, you can raise your hand or turn on your camera, and uh, we will uh, call on you to ask your question. And I see that Ralph Townsend has joined us. Um, and I, so I'm going to ask Ralph if he might want to start with any questions. Um, well, thanks a lot. Uh, David, this, as you know, this uh, issue of the declining labor force has, so the potential declines in the labor force is getting a fair bit of attention now. People are realizing that. Uh, uh, the, the high growth scenario seems pretty unlikely. I mean, yeah. that, that, that we're, and we are not quite on, I think, but on the low growth uh, scenario. I mean, is the, is the, 
it's the only solution for that in migration in terms of the workforce or are there other change other demographic changes that could take place that could ops that could help ameliorate what what i think many businesses see as a pretty uh threatening decline in the total labor force yeah i mean yeah so obviously in migration is the only way if we we're able to keep more people here, that would be a good solution as well. Um, you know, people who go to college here tend to stay longer. Um, so increasing people staying for in-state school could have an impact. Um, there's definitely other ways to maintain the labor force, but historically we've just seen a lot of in-migrants at that mid twenties to early thirties ages. And that has been our growth um, in the past, but you know, kind of trying to stop some of that loss at the high school graduation ages would definitely go a long way to slowing these declines in the working age population. Sort of a follow-up question, and that is, um, in this net migration data, uh, well, let me back up a moment. Alaska is experiencing so, largely the same demographic changes as occurring in the rest of the U.S. Mm -hmm. is, the the decline in the while the decline in the working age population might not be as high in the rest of the U.S. because the rest of the U.S. doesn't have to worry in a big way about net out migration, which Alaska does, obviously. But my point is there is this shift in the demographic, particularly the racial makeup of our ethnic makeup of the population. Uh, I guess the question is, are we, do we know if, for example, uh, the white population is more engaged in uh, the in and out migration in Alaska or the non-white population? How might, the question I'm getting to is, how might the national changes in demography affect migration? That is, is it, I mean, a scenario that's in my head is, oh, the labor force is going to get tighter everywhere. Uh, so Alaska is going to struggle with its old strategy of filling gaps in the labor force by bringing them in from outside. A long question. I apologize. No, absolutely. I, yeah, this is definitely something that's occurring across the entire country. I mean, as the baby boomers, the baby boomers have just been this giant group going through as they've aged their entire lives, they've been kind of this group that was much larger than the group prior to them. And now that they're hitting these retirement ages, I mean, the oldest of the baby boomers are just now 75 years old, youngest around 55. So as they continue to retire, we're just gonna see a massive shift in the labor force. And yeah, I mean, our, our working age population right now in 2020 looks a lot like the working age population in 2008. Um, as far as the, the numbers go. And so this is definitely a shift that's occurring across the country and our birth rates are down. Alaska has now reached birth rates that are low enough to, we aren't at what we refer to as replacement fertility, which is where people are having enough kids to replace the existing generation. The lower 48 has been below replacement fertility since the early 2000s or so. So, I mean, we're, we're gonna have to rely on international migration at some point to make up for the workforce and yeah, I mean, as far as out migrants go right now, you know, as, as I showed in those slides, a lot of them are older. And so, you know, we're, we're seeing that group for us, the baby boomer population is overwhelmingly white. And so, yes, a lot of the population is white going out, but, you know, um, it's just based on the age structure kind of thing there. Um, I'm not sure if I answered that fully, but, but I do agree that it's going to be a tough, tight labor market, you know, as far as like competing for these people to come to the state, maybe more so than it has been in the past. You mentioned international migration. Do you, in that net out migration that we've seen uh, in the last uh, eight, eight or nine years, is there, is, do you know if the decline in international in migration is a contributing factor, factor to that? Obviously, it, Nationwide, we've seen reductions in in-migration because of changes in uh, immigration policy in the last mm -hmm. five years or so. 
it's sorry, I guess I missed the first part of that. Sorry, the volume well, on this computer is terrible. Is, is is there any evidence that the uh, nationwide decline in international in migration is part is contributing to uh, the again our our Net population loss is because not enough people are coming in. And, and we, the people going yeah. out are the same. But is is the people who are is there evidence that the people who aren't coming in, some of those are not coming in because uh, in the past they would have been migrants. I think that's entirely possible. I, I would have to look specifically to say, but that is a very interesting point. If like the rate, you know, the slow drop in international migrants is looks very similar to the drop in Alaska migrants. I, that would be a very interesting thing to look at. I, I haven't looked at it specifically, but in my mind, it makes sense that, you know, we, we might see that, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's hard to say. And, and as you point out, these things are mostly controlled by national forces that, that we don't have any, any control over whatsoever. And it looks like we have a question in the chat. Uh, what information, if any, do you have about the relationship between net migration and A, government services, like school quality, and B, quality of life, to the extent there is a way to measure it? Put differently, I'm interested in how fiscal decisions about government services may or may not affect net migration. So this is an interesting question and something we talk about a lot in my office, uh, just, you know, that people crave fiscal certainty. Um, I, as you all know, I, I'm not a parent, but I know you know, school quality is extremely important to people. So that's some of the first things people look at. So I'm sure that, you know, school quality is definitely going to have an impact on, on that migration. Um, but I, I, it's kind of an interesting question as far as the fiscal deci decisions about government services in Alaska. You know, again, what we're not, we're not seeing a mass exodus. And I think the people leaving the state would be the ones most familiar with what's going on fiscally in the state people coming into the state, I don't know how much they would know about what's going on with government services in the state. Maybe some older migrants might, but I guess I don't picture a 25 year old knowing a ton about the fiscal situation to the state they're moving to. I'm picturing them more just, I can't wait to have a wild adventure in Alaska kind of mindset um, kind of thing. Great, all right, thank you. Um, David, you you addressed this with an earlier question uh, about uh, from Teresa Holt about uh, do you think the census numbers are a true reflection in light of COVID? And of course, one of the challenging policy situations that we deal with is that uh, we do have a dynamic population, yet so many policy decisions are framed by a, a, you know, the uh, decennial census. And so uh, the information is dated. Of course, uh, in labor and research and analysis section, you're working constantly to do new projections and try and update data sets uh, based on information on the ground. Uh, but in light of the very significant changes that we see societally from, from COVID, and certainly um, what I think, you know, social scientists are describe, describing as the great reset, people reevaluating uh, their lifestyle choices and options for dual income households. Um, how do you see some of these, these trends maybe affecting not only population overall, but, but uh, workforce moving forward? I, I, that's a great question uh, and kind of the question of the time right now, obviously with the, the labor force, um, people are constantly trying to hire and not able to, as you're alluding to. And um, I, I guess I don't know. Um, in 2020, we thought there was kind of be kind of muted net migration due to the fact that a lot of times people move for school. Well, that went virtual, so you didn't have to move. People move for jobs. People weren't necessarily hiring at the time. So a lot of the reasons that people would move were not in play in that in 2020. And we kind of saw that reflected in our PFD applications for 2021. We saw what we believe to be kind of the first increase in PFD applications this year prior to uh, 2016. Um, there was a jump in like, I think 2019 PFD applications, but we think that was related to uh, Governor Dunleavy um, promising back pay plus a large PFD. 
So more people registered for the permanent fund dividend that year. We don't think that was a real increase, but this year we do think there was a real increase, which we just to believe that maybe not quite as many people left the state. We don't have all of our inputs for the estimates yet. We, I'm not, it's not a big enough increase that we don't think there will be negative net migration. We just don't think it will be as big as it was in previous years. But I, I guess I don't know where we're heading. I, I, you know, obviously there was talk early on that, oh, the $600 was causing people not to work. And, you know, that was kind of tough to believe at the time for people who study these things. But um, now we know it's clear that that was not the, the issue. So I, I, I like to think people are, you know, had this uh, situation where they didn't have to worry about money as much and then, you know, have reevaluated and they're going to go on to school or trades or something, you know, to, to make a better living for themselves. Um, but I, that's just my own thinkings. I, I don't know where we're headed as far as that goes. Um, I see Ralph's turned his camera back on. Do you have another question, Ralph? David, on that, that question, have we looked at the, have we looked at the decline in employment in Alaska by demographic groups? I mean, we know nationwide, one of the big forces was that the group that was near retirement, which is not at all unusual. Whenever there's a recession, the group near retirement retires more quickly. That is, they lose their job. Rather than look for a job for two years, they retire. So we know part of the nationwide decline was because there was an exceptionally, like I think it was two to three times as many people left the workforce in that group near age 65 as we would have expected. Do we have any similar data for Alaska about what the, the demographics of the change in the labor force uh, participation? So we do have some data on that. We, we, we do have good 2020 job numbers at this point. So this is something that I can actually look at it's not something off the top of my head that we have looked at, um, but yeah, we could definitely take a look at it by age and see what's going on there. Um, I imagine we followed the national trend, but I, I do know a lot of our losses were in, well, as with the rest of the country, the service industry and that sort of thing, which is typically younger workers. So definitely a lot of younger workers um, kind of, on the sidelines right now uh, in Alaska and nationwide. Great. Okay, thanks. Hey, we have a question uh, from Barbara Haney um, and she's asking if, if you've looked at a uh, variation of new migrants in migrants to uh, by region. So for example, are uh, in migrants choosing um, are, are their preferences driven by uh, opportunities, uh, for example, that might be available in urban areas or, um, you know, she's noting that Matsu and Kenai have appeared to pick up, you know, population where some of the urban areas appear to have lost population. Is that movement uh, within the state uh, or is it the in-migrant choices? Yeah, so totally, uh, it's a great question, yeah. So in-migrants migrate typically to three places to Anchorage, or sorry, in migrants from down south typically migrate to three areas. That's Anchorage, Fairbanks, Juneau. Um, they don't, most people move to Anchorage and then go to Matsu. Uh, you know, there's there's some draws obviously to Matsu with the lower cost of housing. You can get more land, that sort of thing. So definitely there's some people who migrate from the lower 48 directly to Matsu, but overall Matsu sees a net migration loss to down south. They, so they have more people moving out of the state than they do coming in from uh, outside of the state. So their gains are from within the state, largely for migration. Um, Kenai, similarly, uh, I'd have to double check on if they actually have a net loss to the lower 48, but they definitely see a lot of gains from Anchorage, that sort of thing. Um, and Kenai has actually gotten considerably older over the last 10 years. And we, you know, it's somewhat people kind of retiring and then moving from Anchorage down to the Kenai Peninsula, more full-time basis. Um, so we're definitely seeing that pattern start to emerge. But yeah, it's definitely a very specific pattern of people moving into the urban areas in the state and then kind of disperse out to the more rural areas. Of course, there is some, you know, if you have a family in Nome or something, you will migrate to Nome. It's just not that many people have family in Nome to 
to cause them to migrate there. And the same thing with Matsu, it's just people kind of move into the hubs and then move out, um, out from there. Okay. Um, I, I've got a couple of questions for you I wanted to touch on. Um, a former economic development colleague of mine, uh, Mark Lotman out of Arizona, wrote a book probably 20 years ago uh, looking at demographics and, and really his thesis was the places, the, the geographies, the places that are going to be successful are those that win the battle to attract and maintain that working age population and based on the data that you're, you're showing us, um, we have some significant challenges. And, and given that a lot of our work opportunities, although we have many that require people with uh, um, professional degrees and, and advanced, advanced degrees, we also have a great need for people in skilled trades. And so I'm just wondering, uh, from your, your vantage point in the Department of Labor, what do you think are the the natural reactions or responses that we should be taking to uh, assure a, a, a strong economic future? It's tough. Uh, I know we, you know, in, in Juno, we're always talking about, oh, we need to attract workers that can work anywhere, um, which looking outside the window right now, it's tough to, to do that. <laughs> it's uh, quite a quite a rough day outside here in Juno, but but I'm, I'm originally from Florida and I love Alaska. So, and, you know, we'll don't plan on leaving anytime soon. Um, so I think, you know, if we could attract people to our natural beauty of the state and that sort of thing, I think would be one way we could expand the economy. Um, and, you know, there was some hope of that with the, the zoom and whatnot, you know, early on in the pandemic, but it, it's, it's tough to track, in real time so it's kind of hard to say how much growth we had there but we don't think it was too much um but yeah i think just attracting people to the state for what we have naturally would be a, a good way and then again trying to keep people in the state and not having them go outside because we know that once kids leave the state to go to college they're less likely to return so you know um, training an in-state labor force would be a definitely a good start well, and your your graphs showed us some of those sort of family life cycle issues with you know in migration and out migration, um, and I'm wondering you know again with the the grain of the population, I know a lot of other uh, places around the country have really uh, thought about and invested their time in retaining that uh, aging population and employing grain in place strategies. And I'm just wondering what you're seeing from other states, other uh, demographers, what what their kinds of approaches might be. Sorry, I kind of broke up there for a second. So as far as keeping the aging population, is that OK? Um, yes. Yeah, it's interesting because I think Alaska is kind of behind the behind a little bit when compared to other states, just because we haven't had a large senior population. As COVID is currently showing us, our hospital system is, you know, it's not, it can be overwhelmed. Um, and so that's kind of a scary thing. I, I know in Juneau, you know, we don't even have a cardiologist. So it's kind of tough to, you know, if, if you have a heart issue, are you going to stay in Juneau where you're going to have to fly to Seattle if there's some kind of emergency? Um, so I think there's definitely things that the state can do to maintain these people, but it's, we're a little bit behind. And unfortunately, you know, we can't change our climate. And so the winter is being hard on people. It, they're gonna continue to be hard on people. So that's something that we won't really be able to change and might be a limiting factor in keeping people here. All right. Well, I know that uh, I, I, I always used to say, I think I lost the connection. I'm not sure. Um, I, I think that you still have your connection. I think Winetta may have lost hers. Oh, okay. Okay. 
Uh, you, oh, you, so are now, you are now the host as Renata is uh, working on it. Okay. It looks like she's coming back on maybe. Just had a little uh, reset there. Uh, okay, I see Ralph and Gunner. So uh, let's, let's ask Gunner first. Go ahead, Gunner. Um, I, I just wanted to offer a, a, a brief reaction to the uh, uh, discussion we've just been having. Uh, first, David, I think that the 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 um, the trends you've been showing um, in in the first part of your discussion are um, extremely interesting and um, extremely important and uh, are are going to be very much part of the forces driving uh, our economy and our social uh sort of social issues uh going forward and are very much deserving of attention uh research and um uh publicization I mean, there's not a demography is not generally a sexy topic that people uh sort of talk about um but i think it 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 is it deserves to be much more so um and so you know i, I for this way, if you ever need a cheerleader for funding your research or or the importance of this kind of stuff, I, I think it's it's there and it's growing. And second, I think uh, parallel to that, um, the, there's a, a number of major policy questions that we're facing regarding um, uh, how how can we retain uh, a, a la attract and retain a labor force and how can we uh, attract and retain uh, well retain seniors who might otherwise migrate um, and who represent a major uh, potential source of uh, income to the economy retirees uh, if we can keep them versus if if we lose them and so we re and I'm, I'm sort of struck by in all the um, uh, uh, I don't know if it dig if discussion quite dignifies it anymore the political um, uh, stuff that's going on. We're not hearing a lot of serious discussion about um, what is keeping or going to keep or attract Alaskans going forward. And this is this is really important to begin to understand. And I think it, I personally think it directly relates to um, how much money we ought to be spending on parks, on schools, uh, on, on the university, uh, and, and a variety of public services. Um, and we, we really need to understand if, to what extent are we shooting ourselves economically in the, in the foot or not by uh, sort of attempting to um, uh, save pennies on various public services when, they, when there may, may or may not, we, the research is needed, be direct tie-ins to um, the ex extent to whether we're able to attract a labor force and or keep young people and and or seniors. Okay. Yeah, That's my soapbox for today. <laughs> no, absolutely, I totally agree. I mean, it's um, it's going to cost money, and it's something that we're not really doing at this time. And um, it's I don't want to say too much, but yeah, yeah, it's definitely <laughs> something that will. Um, we should be investing in, in my mind, because well, as we talked about earlier with the schools, you know, having good schools is is paramount to keeping people in place. I mean, people want what's best for their kids and education is the, you know, the start of that. So um, investing in education, I mean, we have leaky roofs here in Juneau at our schools and we're cutting capital budgets. So it's uh, frustrating at times. But um, yeah, definitely it's gonna cost money and, and people move, I mean, like I was in San Francisco not too long ago and I mean, I'm not ever gonna move to a giant city but I, I see why people like it. I mean, there's great parks, there's huge bike paths and, and Anchorage has a lot of that but it's something that you have to keep up with and um, it costs cost money to invest in these things that you know keep people here. Quality of life is the main reason we all live, live here, I think. Great. Um, Ralph, did you have another question before we? No. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Cheryl, I'm going to bring you back in. Thanks, Juanette. And thank you, David, for joining us this morning. And Gunnar, you really, uh, you, you summarized the reason why um, we started down this path 
uh, in terms of broadening the discussion about the costs of fiscal uncertainty. And one of those costs is the failure to invest in um, the areas about attracting and retaining workforce and seniors, et cetera. So, so that is the reason why we wanted to, to uh, go down this road in terms of discussions. Um, to that end, if any of our participants today have suggestions for other speakers who can elaborate on this, um, this challenge and help define uh, it, you know, please let Juanetta or myself know. Uh, we'd welcome that kind of input. So with that, thank you all for joining us this morning and I'll turn it back to Juanetta for any last minute commercials. Okay. <laughs> all right, thank you, Cheryl. Um, well, we do wanna again uh, acknowledge uh, uh, David, thank you for your time uh, to uh, to amplify what, uh, what Gunnar said. Uh, Demographics may not be the hottest, sexiest topic in, in government or in life in general, but um, as, as we said in, in putting this together, uh, the census and demographics are one of the most important data sets and policy making uh, documents that is produced by government and really appreciating the value of that I think is, is something that we, we need to bring forward. Uh, so again, thank you, David. Um, we will uh, be having a, uh, a healthcare reform study group that uh, will be starting uh, this month. It is October now. Um, so uh, I just want to uh, uh, alert uh, folks online to that. Uh, we'll have our first session on October uh, 21st with Commissioner Adam Crum and Deputy Commissioner Al Wall. Uh, that'll be uh, again on Thursday, uh, the 21st at 8 a.m. And uh, we'll be having a, a series of sessions looking forward to, um, to uh, 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 illustrating what are some opportunities for uh, healthcare reform, for cost savings, and impro improving quality of outcomes. Uh, also, please take note that on November 4th, uh, we will be having the Hickel and Egan Awards that evening at 6 p.m. That will be a hybrid um, event and we'll be having uh, information coming out about that next week. And another thing on your calendar uh, to mark is December 8th, and that will be uh, the annual legislator meet and greet. Uh, that will be at noon on December 8th. Uh, we do have space for that reserved at the Denina Center, and our insiders in the healthcare industry tell us that maybe the health curve, the uh, transmission curve will be at a point where we can consider resuming in-person events. Um, so uh, hopefully cross your fingers and uh, we'll uh, look forward to uh, that event in person. All right, with that, again, thank you to David and thank you to all of you for being with us. Uh, enjoy your Friday and I uh, hope you all have a great weekend. Thanks, Melinda. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.